situation? Well, primarily the the Colombian cartels are the ones that supply the Mexican cartels, especially when it comes to cocaine. When it comes to methamphetamine, you know, they supply most of the drugs, but the Mexican cartel, cartels now have evolved to, they, they, they produce a lot of their own drugs too. All right, so then the Mexican cartels bring it into the United States. And they, they employ the services of different gangs in different cities, uh, like Chicago, um, LA, uh, Miami, different places, right? Um, and and the, 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 the local gangs from any specific areas are the ones that are in charge of the distribution in the neighborhoods. Okay. Um, so essentially the, the Colombians are the producers, the Mexican cartels are like the middlemen, and then the American gangs do the street level distribution of the product and sell it. Correct. Okay. Um, in, in terms of who experiences a loss, so if there's a, a loss in the United States with the product, if law enforcement gets it or something happens, it gets stolen, whatever the case might be, um, who absorbs that loss? Is it the Mexican cartels, the American organization that's supposed to sell it on the street, or is it the Colombians? Or, or do, does everybody share? The, Mex the Mexican cartels do not um, take the loss of merchandise very lightly. Somebody is going to pay somehow, whether it's the individual who was in charge of the operation on the street level, or many times, for example, let's say that I'm dealing with the cartels and I'm the guy in charge of, and they give me, let's say, 10 kilos of cocaine, and somehow I get arrested and I lose it. They will generally kill my whole family to let everybody else know this is not acceptable. You know, somebody's going to pay. That, that's kind of where do. I was heading next. Okay. Are, are there um, general criteria, I guess, that, that, that are typical of a cartel hit, uh, specifically a Mexican cartel hit? Is there any uh, kind of standard methodology to the tactics they employ? Well, cartels uh, generally, when they do hits, they kill they kill the entire family. They don't they don't leave because their 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 logic is that that child is going to get older later, and they become a problem. So they come in, and also they do that to also to instill fear in not the community but the underworld. See, everything is geared towards the underworld. What they do, they're not concerned about what Miss Hernandez and her family thinks about it because they're not involved. Now, they can have their thoughts and their opinions, but they're not trying to target them. They're dealing with people that are dealing in the underworld. So the message to them is, if you mess with us, if you lose this, if you lose that, this is what happens to you or your family. And is there anything that's, um, I guess, standard or reoccurring in terms of the method by which they dispatch people that are responsible well, for stolen product or lost product? The way they kill them? Yes. Well, generally it's gru it's pretty gr gruesome. It's a they they kill them in a, in a gruesome manner. The the message has to you know has to uh, be to towards the underworld that this is. This is the way we kill people. Most of the time, they decapitate people. Uh, they beat them to death. They, you know, there's different methodologies that they use, but it's always gruesome. Okay. Um, let me ask you about uh, the potential involvement of a female in a group that's um, targeting someone for assassination. Is that something common? And if so, wh why is that common? That the cartel would utilize a female within the team that's been uh, sent to kill somebody? No, the females are usually, and, and I know that, you know, that this idea that I haven't been a member of the gang for 40 years that uh, I, I don't know what I'm talking about, but the truth of the matter is that, that that methodology has been used for years. The woman is used because if somebody knocks on the door and it's a female, 
pretty much people on the other side of the door are going to be less uh, worried or careful because it's a woman. But the woman is used to op- so that they will open the door that so others can rush in. That's what the woman's used for. Not to, to commit the murder itself, only to uh, it help them gain entry. Um, what about potential child victims? Is that something that you see as a uh, repetitive theme within cartel murders? Absolutely. They kill whole entire families. They do that. That's what they do. And why do they do that? Once again, it's to send a message to the underworld that if you, especially if you have family, if you um, do something wrong or steal from us or whatever the case may be or snitch on us or whatever, then this is what we do to people like, to your people, to make sure that it doesn't happen again. And let me ask you about the Los Zetas cartel in particular. Um, you indicated that you had family members that were members of the Los Zetas cartel. I had one. I had. I had. I had one family member who was. Uh, he's no longer with us. He uh, was shot by the Mexican authorities in a shootout in the plaza in Reynosa, Tamaulipas. Did you ever have an opportunity to conduct first-person interviews with him about his experience? I did. Okay. Um, through those interviews, were you able to ascertain whether there is any particular symbol associated with the Zetas cartel? I was. W- what is their symbol? So one of the, the re- one of the things they leave behind, and it's not left for, once again, law enforcement, because law enforcement wouldn't know anyway, it's left for the underworld as a message. This is who did this, and this is what will happen to you if you uh, mess with us or mess with our money or whatever the case may be, whatever it is that they did, right? And so he told me, because I explained that uh, what does it mean when they leave a spade? And he goes, he in Spanish he told me it's... Your Honor, I'm going to object as to hearsay. Overruled. He, he indicated in Spanish... Es el as de espadas, which means in the cards, it's the ace of spade. Now, he said that the, mili- that the Zetas have a military background. And he said that the ace of spade in the military in Mexico indicates death. And so that is the manner in which they send the message, the Zetas, through that ace of spade to other people, underworld people, that it was them, and that if you mess with us, this was going to happen. Um, and uh, again, in terms of uh, repetitive themes in, in the way that murders are carried out, do the Zetas and other Mexican cartels typically send a single individual or multiple individuals to commit these murders? What? It, no, g- generally it's more than one, but it could be one, but it depends on the number of people. So, for example, and they've done their homework, they know how many people are involved and how many people are there, or whatever the case may be. And so based on the number of individuals who live in the home, they would send that number of people, not necessarily four, but I mean, they would send more than one, I believe, from, from what he told me, if, you know, to, to make sure that the act was, you know, committed and taken care of. Now, you had a chance in this case to review crime scene photos, correct? I normally don't, but I wanted to see these. Okay. And other case-related documents and information, correct? That's correct. As well as uh, have conversations with the defense reconstructionist, uh, Mr. Knox, correct? That's correct. Now, I don't want you to testify about anything Mr. Knox told you, um, nor do I want an opinion about whether you ultimately think this offense was a cartel hit. What I'd like to know is if you have any opinion as to whether there are indicators based on the evidence you, you reviewed uh, of potential cartel involvement in these murders? Everything that I reviewed points directly towards the Zetas. And, and, uh, and you know, the, the spade, the way it was placed against the wall, uh, it didn't have any blood, it wasn't used in the murder. It was a clear message, right? So it was all by itself, according to the pictures that I, that I reviewed, next to the lady's body, right, on the wall. It didn't have no blood, so to me it indicated that it wasn't used in the murder itself. The viciousness of the way that children were killed uh, and, 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 
then the way the victim was, the, the mother was killed, you know, beaten, shot, stabbed. I mean, you know, the viciousness of the crime itself indicates to me, and, and I've done a lot of, you know, cases and they're vicious as well, but not like this and not where they have children, especially when it deals with gangs. So this is on the high end of violence even for a cartel? Well, it's definitely high end. Thank you. No further questions. Doctor, now we talked a little bit during um, the board hour of your qualifications about that you served time in prison, but how many prior felony convictions do you have? I believe it's five. And another thing I don't think we've covered up um, or covered is that you have, you're being paid for your testimony here today, is that correct? Just like you, yes. So. Everybody gets paid here except the jury. Okay. Crime pays really well. But I'm not testifying, jurors. you're testifying. I understand, so. and I'm answering your question. Doctor, I get paid. Caleb Briggs, listen up, please, Mark, please. Okay. All right. um, I get Receive paid. What's your hourly rate? I charge $200 an hour. And how many hours have you billed in this case? I think so far $26,000. Okay. And that doesn't include? This time. This time, your Correct. travel here and um, the time you've been waiting here and your testimony for the Correct. Day. Correct. And how long have you been in town? Or have you been traveling? How long have you been on the clock this time? I left uh, Tuesday at 2 o'clock California time, and I've been here since. Okay. And so you're at $200 an hour for that time period? Well, not when I'm asleep, but other than that, you know. Okay. Now, You've never testified for the state or the federal government, is that correct? No, that's correct. And you've indicated that there are no um, <coughs> peer review academic studies um, on whether something is a Zeta murder or not, is that correct? Well, let me clarify something. I, afterward, I was thinking, if you go to Google Scholar, which is a peer-reviewed search engine, that is, everybody knows about it, and everybody agrees that it's reliable. I believe there are uh, uh, studies or information, there's information there that can support uh, whatever it is you're looking for. Maybe, maybe not. But so I don't know any, any directly uh, studies. I do know of a book, The Wolf Boys, that was written about the Zetas. Who wrote the book? I, I don't remember the gentleman's name. But I mean, I'm sure if you Google it, you can find it. And uh, did I understand you to say if you go to this Google Scholar, you can Google it and pretty much find anything you want to support whatever pretty opinion much. you have? I think you can, yes. Okay. Or not find it if it's not there. Now, a lot of opinions that you've expressed today are based upon your Google searches, which included reading online, newspaper articles, magazine articles, and things such as that. Is that correct? That's not correct. I mean, some of them, I've used some of those, but my, my opinion is based on that and the discovery that was provided by you folks, well, not you, but to the defense, the discovery and the... Um, interviews that I conducted uh, with individuals that, that are in, in the know of cartels and so forth and so on. So there's a number of elements. Well, let me be a little bit more precise my question if that wasn't, my question wasn't clear. Your opinion about whether or not something constitutes a Zeta crime scene is based on 
your reading newspaper articles and Googling the subject, as well as talking to your now deceased cousin. Is that correct? That's part, again, the gruesomeness of the, of the, of the crime itself, the fact that they killed children. I'm not saying that other people don't kill children, but generally speaking, cartels, that's their MO, modus of apprehension, they kill the entire family, the viciousness of how they did it, and more importantly, the spade, the little sh the shovel that was left. Now, you're assuming something belong, a, a cartel killing would generally include somebody who's cheated the cartel, is that correct? Generally. Well, the Mexican cartel, they don't send people up to commit hits in the United States for people who steal from street level gangs, is that correct? Because they've got no skin in that game because they've already been paid by the street level gang for the drugs that the street level gang is selling, is that correct? Unless the, the street level gang pays the cartel to do the killing that because, for example, let's say hypothetically that this, these drugs or whatever the case may be were from them to begin with, then, then I'm, I'm sure they would. And you're sure they would because? Because I was a criminal myself for a long time involved in criminal organization and I know how the criminal mind works. And so at everything that I've learned and everything that I've heard from people that I've interviewed, you cannot mess with cartels or they're going to get you. They might not do it tomorrow, but they're eventually going to get you. That's why. So the Mexican cartels are now being hired, are, are now being um, hired by local street gangs to commit murders in the street gangs territory. I don't know if they're now, but I'm sure they did at that time, at the, uh, in this particular case. And you're basing that on the review of the crime scene photos? Well, that and the discovery and everything that I know about it. Um, interviews of different witnesses. And you're basing these opinions on your personal review of what you read on the internet, people you've talked to, but as it relates directly to the Zeta, Zetas and how they conduct the hits, that, I think as you previously testified, is relied on solely by your now dead cousin. Not solely on him, he was a Zeta. So he knew the inner workings, he did time for them he was pretty close to the people on top, so he understood what was going on. He didn't know about this particular case specifically because there's so many people with so many cases, so many things going on. But not, I wasn't only basing it on that. That is, I based it on the, on the viciousness of the crime, the shovel against the wall not being used in the <coughs> crime, his information to me about how they, the modus of operandi that they use when people do something against them. Uh, and of course, all the research that I did on Google, Google Scholar and all that in, in, in the internet. Did you rely on your opinions, um, the statements of Carlos Santos? I did. Now, isn't it true that you based your opinion on that cartels use women um, to help gain entry is because one was used in when your, I believe it was your brother who was murdered in 1977? That wasn't a cartel. That was a criminal organization. But it's not based on that. I used to do it myself back in the day when I was involved. It's not an uncommon thing to use a woman. People's guards drop when a woman knocks at the door and they see it's a woman as opposed to two men standing on the front door. I don't think that a person, a woman, is gonna open the door for two men that they don't know. But they do, they will when, they, when there's a woman, even maybe they, they don't even know her, but it's a woman. 
So it's on their level. So it's just a psychological thing. And, you know, we, as, as back then, as gang members, we used to study all that stuff. And, again, you indicated that your last gang experience was more than 40 years ago. My personal gang experience as yes. a gang member? Yes. yes. Now, you say cartels send a message by doing killings of families if somebody hasn't paid them or if, they, or if they've been wronged by people. Is that correct? Pretty much, yeah. And that they leave it in such a manner that you know that it is a, the drug cartel has committed the crime. It's a clear message to the underworld, not to law enforcement, because law enforcement doesn't know, but to the underworld, the people that are involved with cartels, it's a clear message to them that, that this is what happens, that who, this is who did so it. So you're telling me that law enforcement wouldn't know, know these signs or to look for these signs? Well, they didn't know about it on this <laughs> sign. They didn't know about the shovel in this particular case. I never heard law enforcement say anything about that shovel. In fact, they were confused about the show from what I read. So, I, yes, I am saying that. All right. So, law enforcement don't have confidential informants. They don't have people who infiltrate the cartels. They don't compare notes whenever they're looking at crime scenes. Whenever you have multiple family where family members are being killed at multiple places, people don't compare and contrast. As they, as they try to investigate to see if these crimes are related or not? Well, there's no doubt they have confidential informants. Now, the confidential informant is that with the information they're giving them reliable because there's not really any way for you could most of the time corroborate what they're telling you. So that's one. I give you that one. But do they share with each other? I'm sure they do. But what I'm saying is that in particular case, they didn't seem to share with nobody with any other law enforcement. Now, I'm not sure because I'm not law enforcement, so I couldn't tell you specifically or concretely that they did or did not. What I do know is that that spade was never explained the way my cousin, who was a Zeta member, explained it. That's what I'm saying. All right, so your premise rises and falls on what your dead cousin supposedly told you a few years ago. Not supposedly. He did tell me. There's no supposedly about it. Do you have it recorded? No, I don't have it recorded. Do you have it documented in any way? I don't. So the only person who knows about it and can recant it and tell us what he said is you. Hey, absolutely. Now... You say the the number of people who are being killed um, dictates the, the amount of people who come in and do the killing. Is that correct? I think that's one of the elements they use. For example, when they killed my brother, there was one, two, three and a woman. So the woman was used to knock on the door. And he answered the door, and then two guys rushed in. There was a guy driving, so there was three for one person. It was supposed to be me, but I wasn't there, so it was my brother. Okay, generally speaking, they're not going to send one guy to commit a homicide in a home. They're just not going to do it, not one guy. It's going to be multiple guys. And a woman. Wow. Well, I would imagine they used a woman. Now, the, the killings uh, or the relationship between the gangs. Um, if the Mexican cartel is the ones that have been wrong, they're going to exact their punishment, correct? Correct. Do they do it themselves or do they hire it out? No, they do generally do it themselves. And 
you familiar with the Vice Lords? Yeah, Chicago, yeah. Do they handle their own problems? I don't know if they handle all of their problems, but they do. And the Zeta handles their problems? Yeah, yep. Now, when you say your the Ace of Spades your cousin talked about, um, that sign is left there so other people in the underworld will know that this was a Zeta hit, correct? Correct. So anybody who knows about the case or looks into the case and sees that shovel will know this is a Zeta hit. Well, not everybody. No, what do I'm talking about? Other Zetas, for instance. Sure, of course. A situation where somebody is trying to show that, hey, I fixed the problem, so don't blame me about it anymore. They would leave a sign at the scene as a calling card. I don't think that has anything to do with being blamed. I ha I think it has to do with being wronged. They don't they don't go kill people because you're blaming them. They go they go kill people. The Zetas the cartels kill people when they feel that they've been wronged. Okay? Or if maybe if someone pays them, then they might do it because they were indirectly connected. Maybe uh, the person was selling drugs that originally originated from them. So they may get involved in something like that. But they would leave their call signs so anybody who sees it would know that they're the ones who have committed the crime. Anybody involved in the underworld. Do they admit that they commit the crime? The individuals who commit the crime go out and brag about it? Well, I'm sure they brag about it when they, if you read the Wolf Boys, they used to brag to each other. To each other? Yes. They don't go knocking on law enforcement's door saying, hey, I did it, do they? No. So if the Zetas were to look at these crime scene photos, they would see that it was a Zeta hit. I'm sure they would. So there'd be no reason for somebody to go around and say, hey, I'm the one who did it, and tell that to law enforcement who somehow publishes out there because there wouldn't be a need to because the sign is in the photograph. Well, I couldn't say that because I don't understand. I don't know why somebody would do that unless they were indirectly involved or directly involved. But they wouldn't need to do it because they've left their sign. The Zetas left their sign. But the other guy, whoever he is, if he's not involved with the Zetas, it has nothing to do with him. He's not a Zeta. He's not a Zeta, so he's not involved in it. Well, he's not involved in the actual killing. He could be involved in other ways. Now, the, you say the shovel is the sign of a calling card because it was not used during the commission of the offense and that it was laid beside the body to show we this is our handiwork. Yes. And it was against the wall? What's against the wall? Against the wall next to the body? I, I, think think it was against, I, think, it was I think it was against the wall. I don't remember specifically, but I, I think it was a picture that I saw. Doctor, what's your date of birth? an existing um, drug trafficking organization that involves Colombian Mexican cartels. Um, 
if somebody who's a part of that drug trafficking organization brings in someone else who ultimately ends up ripping off somebody that's a part of that, uh, who is responsible for that? The person that brought them in. And if the person who brings them in doesn't take care of it, what happens to that person? They kill them. No further question. Hey, Jerry, I have a question in this room. All right, you can step down. Thanks. We need to keep them further. No, you're right. Okay, thank you. You need to have some drinks? No. Are you excused? Call your next witness. This time it's time to call uh, Mark Lewis. Yes, Your Honor. Mark Lewis. <coughs> Investigator Lewis, um, at some point during the investigation of this case, um, members of the Tallahassee Police Department uh, forensic team and, and investigators responded to Jack McLean Park, correct? Yes, sir. Um, inside Jack McLean Park, kind of at the back of the park, if you would go off to the right instead of going straight by the pool and all that. There's a bathhouse, right? There is. Um, and a, a pavilion, like a picnic pavilion back there as well? Yes. Um, and this was what, like five, five, six, seven days after the murder? You guys responded there? I know it was after the homicide. I can't tell you exactly. I want to, I want to say about a week or maybe a little more or a little less. Somewhere. Okay. And um, who all went out there? Um, I know it was myself, Investigator Corbett, um, Investigator Dubrava, and then forensic people as forensic well? Forensic person, yes. Okay. And um, you all discovered a, a trash can containing multiple items that had been burned up, correct? Or had been on fire to some extent. The can was on fire. The items were not. Okay. Um, did it appear that uh, like the top of the bag and the top of the, uh, the, the items on top of, inside the trash can had been lit on fire as well? If I can re uh, these are pictures that I need to reference it. Yes, okay. yes, sir. For reference, um, he's picking up what will be Defense Composite Exhibit uh, 9A through EE. E. I see the candy you're talking about, sir. And so it looks like it was set on fire. It's, the bag looks torn, but I guess. And you all did determine, in fact, that it was there, there was ash and singed yes. items and all that. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, inside the trash can, there were a number of items located. Um, a T-shirt that had suspected blood on it. Is that right? Yes. And you have that item there as well, correct? It says a white collar shirt. That's one of them, and then that other bag next to it. White T-shirt with suspected blood, yes. And um, that was recovered from inside the trash can? Yes. And similarly, the uh, collared shirt was recovered from inside the trash can? Yes. And then there were uh, a bunch of latex gloves that had suspected blood on them as well, correct? Yes. And another set of gray gloves that had suspected blood, correct?
don't see the gray gloves that you referenced. In the pictures, you mean? I don't. Um, one of those exhibits there has all those gray gloves in a, in a single evidence bag. Can you look at that and let me know which TPD number that is? I think it was, I think it was 12A. Maybe I'm wrong about that. That was discovered inside the trash can as well, right? Yes. And then the uh, the latex gloves, those were TPD numbers 7A through 11A? That's correct. Okay. Your Honor, at this time, without objection from the state, I would admit uh, the pictures, which was pre-marked for identification, is Defense Composite Exhibit 9A through EE, um, Defense Exhibit number 22, the white T-shirt, Defense Exhibit number 23, the white collared shirt, Defense Composite Exhibit Number 24A through E, the latex gloves, and Defense ex uh, Composite Exhibit 25A through F, the other gloves, the gray gloves from Jack McLean. Sorry. Okay, Sorry. 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 No further questions for the witness. Yes, Officer Lewis, you testified that law enforcement officers responded to that location about a week after the homicide? Correct. Um, fair to say at that particular time you're doing everything, um, forensics are still out seeing you, everything you can track down anything that may possibly be related to this particular homicide? Absolutely. Isn't it true that during the course of your investigation, subsequent follow-up, you uh, determined that those trash cans in that park was cleaned up on almost a daily basis? That's correct. So subsequent to that, you would have learned that something that was found a week later uh, really would have no bearing at all on the homicide itself. That's correct. No further questions. Redirect. Investigator Lewis, you never called anybody from City of Tallahassee Parks and Rec to find out if those trash cans were actually changed out, correct? During that time, I did not. Um, and uh, your, your testimony is based on your experience. You believed that the trash cans were changed every day, right? It's my knowledge that they are or supposed to be. They're supposed to be. Yes. Now, this was Thanksgiving week, right? I, I guess so. And uh, how far, roughly, was Jack McLean from Brandy Peter's house? Relatively close. Okay. Like a quarter mile, maybe less? Never, never tracked it out, but it's close. Something like that, roughly? With a quarter mile, half mile, somewhere like that. Yes, sir. No further questions. Okay. Any jury? Thank you, Your Honor. 
Ms. Guzman, can you please introduce yourself to the jury and spell both your first and last name? Yes, my name is Diane Guzman, D-I-A-N-E-G-U-Z-M-A-N. And what do you do for a living? I am a crime lab analyst at the Florida Department of Law Enforcement in the biology section. What does that mean exactly? It means I test items of evidence for the presence of biological materials, I isolate DNA from those items and develop a profile. I compare evidentiary profiles to profiles from known individuals, and I write reports. Okay. And um, can you tell me a little bit about your uh, education, training, and experience that, that enables you to perform that analysis? <coughs> yes, I have a bachelor's degree in biology with a minor in chemistry from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. I was originally hired in 2007 by the Wisconsin State Crime Laboratory where I performed DNA analysis. I underwent a year-long intensive training program there run by the NFSTC, which stands for the National Forensic Science and Technology Center. Later, I was employed by FDLE in Tallahassee here, and I underwent approximately six months of additional training. Okay, and do you have to maintain any accreditation or um, certificate of good standing or anything like that in order to be able to conduct the testing that you've described at the Florida Department of Law Enforcement? Yes, I am certified by FDLE, and this includes yearly training and reading relevant materials um, specific to DNA analysis. And have you ever been qualified as an expert to testify on DNA in court? Yes, I have. Approximately how many times? Approximately 10. Okay. Um, at this time, I would tender the witness. Okay, board hire. There you are. You may proceed. Um, Ms. Guzman, did you uh, analyze a couple of uh, exhibits in this case? Yes, I did. Can you tell us what you analyzed? Uh, yes. Did you want to go specifically by report, or do you have a particular item you want I'm to I'm referring, about? yes, ma'am, I'm referring to your report dated March 26, 2018. Um, and we'll be looking at uh, agency exhibits 6A and 13A, FDLE 207-208. Those items are in front of you right there. Okay. Yes, I did examine uh, regarding that specific report three items, FDLE item 116, which is agency exhibit 126, swab of grab bar in tub, FDLE item 207, which is Agency Exhibit 6A, a white t-shirt, and FDLE item 208, which is Agency Exhibit 13A, which was a white collared shirt. I guess we can, uh, this exhibit is not in front of you, we can deal with um, Exhibit 126, which is in evidence as State 63, the swab of the uh, bath bar you weren't able to get sufficient DNA from the remaining part of the swab on that one, correct? I was not. So no analysis could be, be performed on that? After the quantification process, no DNA analysis was performed. That's correct. Okay. And uh, let's talk for a second about um, exhibit or agency exhibit 6A, which is in evidence as uh, defense exhibit 22. It's in front of you there on the bench. Do you recognize that item? Yes, I do. What, if any, analysis did you perform on that item? On this item, I performed a presumptive test for the possible presence of blood, and that test was negative, so I did not continue any further testing. Now, there was red-brown standing all over that, correct? There was, yes. Um, when a DNA, blood included, is exposed to high heat, fire especially, can that degrade the DNA? Yes, it can degrade or damage the DNA. Uh, and over time, obviously this item was collected in uh, 2010, so it's been in some place other than cold storage for uh, a long time now. Um, can that cause further degradation of any DNA? I'm actually not aware of the storage conditions of the item before it came to me. The generally ideal conditions for storing DNA are cool and dry. Any other conditions such as high heat, humidity, mold, um, those can all be 
um, damaging to the DNA. And without going into the, any of the dates or who opened them or anything, can you tell from the packaging how many times that one's been opened? No, I can't. I do see my initials on sealing tape, but I don't know how many times it's been examined. Okay, so only FDLE would initial and make notation when they open it? I'm not sure okay. if other agencies do that. Fair enough. Okay, so um, when DNA is degraded badly, um, can something that is blood, for example, give a negative indication for blood? It's possible. Okay. Let's move on to Exhibit 13A, which is in evidence as Defense Exhibit Number 23. Did you perform analysis on that, the white collared shirt? Yes, I did. And what, if any, results were you able to figure out? I sampled seven different areas. Two of those areas uh, did not have enough DNA to go on for further testing. Of the five remaining areas, another two were too low level. Um, the resulting profile was limited, not interpretable. The remaining three areas that were sampled gave results consistent with an unknown male individual that I subdesignated as male one. Okay, and um, the uh, the DNA or partial profile that you obtained for that unknown male uh, was that consistent from multiple locations on the shirt that you swabbed? There were three samples that went on that resulted in the profile that I subdesignated as male one. The two of the three were complete profiles. That means I had results at all of the areas tested. One was a partial profile, but they were all consistent with male one. Okay, so it's one male. Um, did you compare the partial profile for the unknown male to the profiles of the four victims in the case, as well as Henry Segura? I did compare the profile to all of the standards that had been submitted in the case thus far, and everyone was excluded. Okay, thank you. No further questions. Well, one more. So 13A, that's the shirt that had DNA on it, correct? Yes. Okay. Positive for blood? <coughs> yes, Your Honor. I'm sorry. So Defense Exhibit 23, which would be your 13A, had blood on it and DNA, correct? The, po the presumptive test for blood was positive, yes, and there was enough DNA to continue with testing. And you tested this against 22 different buckle swabs that you had been sampled for uh, as it relates to this particular case, correct? I didn't count the number of known standards that had been submitted, but I did compare my results to all of the standards that were submitted and every individual was excluded. Mr. Prince asked you about three or four or five of them, but bottom line is it's a lot more than that, wasn't it? Give your report there. Standards. There were many standards. Okay. Yes. Uh, why don't you count them for me real quick, please? I count 23. 23. Yes. And not a single one came back and imagined in any way, shape, or form, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, now, isn't it true that a dry shirt typically, uh, if a shirt was dried out and typically stored at room temperature, it really wouldn't grade, degrade DNA, correct? If it was stored at room temperature, depending on the humidity, if it was stored in direct sunlight, it seems like that should be fine. Okay. Well, it really wouldn't degrade blood either, correct? Under ideal conditions, no. And actually, um, I guess it was 22 was the other white shirt? Sure. Okay. Uh, 22, your 6A, uh, both 22 and 23 were both um, collected at the same time, according to the 
bags, correct? I'm not sure when they were collected. No. Sorry. Take a look at the bag real quick. <laughs> They both say 11 26 2010. Okay. And actually, 23 gave indications for blood DNA, so it could be presumed that 22, if it was stored in the same manner, would also give those indications if they were in fact present at any time, correct? It's possible, yes. Okay. And white shirts, when they're burned, they typically turn bl uh, black, do they not? I assume so, yes. Okay. That shirt that, that you tested there, 22, which is your 6A, that had not turned black from any fires or anything like that, had it? No, to my recollection, recollection, no. And item number 23, 13A, same thing? Correct. And in fact, there was nothing during your examination in 23 buckle swabs that gave any indication that these were related to the crime scenes um, or the victim's murder in any way, shape, or form, correct? The specific areas that I tested on Shirt 13A, did all of the standards were excluded? That's the question. Are you ready? No, you aren't. All right, any juror have a question for this witness? All right, if not, you can step down. We need to keep her any further. No, sir, she can be released. Yes, she can be released. Excuse, thank you. Go ahead. You can take a break now, or you got to Yeah, break. you don't want to. Well, we take 10 minutes. All right, let the jury step up. Either that or anything. No, you're right.
understanding of defense is going to call Joe on the ground and recall her. Uh, it's my understanding that what she is testifying to at this Everybody time. Everybody can be seated. No, not you. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, you're looking at me. No, nah, there's, so. <laughs> there's a whole courtroom full of people behind you. Apparently didn't hear me say sit down. <laughs> Sorry, Your Honor. Um, Ms. Brown apparently is going to testify that a couple of days ago or within a very short period of time, Mr. Prince asked her to take a look and do a comparison of Angela Vila's DNA to state's exhibit. Um, I think it's the what is it? defense three. That's the defense three. Um, it's the swab of the cradle of the phone. Um, this has not been disclosed to the state in any way, shape, or form. Um, and we would object to her testifying about that. She was, in fact, of course, an expert that had been declared by the state. But up until any time, she had not been um, done that analysis, nor was she in law enforcement before the law enforcement in the capacity in any way, shape, or form of a DNA analysis, uh, analyst. So we would object to any late disclosure of any uh, analysis that she made on that particular item. Mr. Print. Um, first, I, I should clarify, it's defense 1A and 1B that we'll be referring to for her. Uh, the electroparagram of the swab of uh, 3324, which is the phone cradle. There's nothing to disclose. There's no written report. There's no written finding. I gave her uh, Avila's electroparagram and asked her to uh, make a determination about whether he could be included. She called me last night and said that he could be included or was included. And so I told Mr. Fuchs that just now because she's getting ready to go on after Mr. Noppinger. Um, my reading of the rule doesn't require disclosure of an oral finding. I think it, you know, it makes it even less of a problem that she's a state expert that they're, they've been in communication with, of course, the whole time. Well, I'm certainly going to give them a chance to talk to her before she testifies. When, when were you expecting her to testify? After Mr. Noppinger. Yeah. Well, we might need to rearrange that. Uh, I can call uh, Mr. Bundy next after him if, if you'd like me to. <coughs> Need to do it so they have a chance to talk to her and see what she's saying. Um, um, what, what is your theory of it being a violation? I mean, you, if you were in the same situation and your expert yesterday did something, would it be a discovery violation that you let them know that last night? I do believe that if it's an expert testimony, there has to be prior disclosure to allow for uh, further long depositions, of course, additional testimony by another person if need be um, to do and um, explore any of the, uh, of, of the aspects of it. I heard you make argument to the contrary uh, when it's just been done. Was this something that was just done? Yes, sir. She called right. me last night. I don't find there's a discovery violation, but I am going to let you talk to her before she testifies. So we'll need to arrange that. I'm sure she'll cooperate with you um, and tell you what her what she's done. Uh, once we have that, we can discuss a little further. Anyway, you ready for a jury? Yes, sir. Let's have a jury, please. All rise for the jury. Everybody but the witness be seated, please. If you would face the curtain, be sworn, please. I do not. <laughs> Sorry. Mr. Noppinger, can you please state and spell your first and last name? Yes, it's Kevin Noppinger, K E V I N. Last name is N O P P I N G E R. And what do you do for a living? I'm a DNA forensic scientist. What, what does that mean exactly? Um, uh, basically, um, examining evidence in criminal cases as well as civil cases 
um, determination on DNA profiles, comparing these profiles to various individuals, and determine if they could be the source of the sample or could be eliminated. Okay, and can you tell us a little bit about um, your educational background, training, and experience that enables you to do that kind of work? Okay, I started uh, after college in 1978. I started working with the Alabama Department of Forensic Scientists in their crime laboratory. I switched employments um, in 1982 to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. All of this was before DNA. We did ABO blood typing and looked at enzymes and proteins. Um, from FDLE, and that'd be 1980, 1989, I switched employments to the Broward County Sheriff's Office, which is where I started doing DNA work. Um, 1989, I went to the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia for my DNA training. I uh, left, retired from the Broward County Sheriff's Office. Um, I started a private DNA lab called uh, DNA Labs International, and uh, I left that lab in 2011. Um, I do consulting works, work since then. I was hired by the um, uh, U.S. State Department. Um, I worked in Trinidad and Tobago helping the uh, government set up a DNA database laboratory, as well as uh, trying to get the Forensic Science Center uh, nationally accredited. And also I currently are working with um, Caribbean Forensic Services. Uh, it's a private DNA lab. Uh, recently I got them uh, internationally accredited. Uh, they do forensic DNA work down there. Okay, and have you ever testified as an expert in the field of DNA analysis before? Yes, I've testified over um, over 500 times, uh, eight states, uh, eight different countries, and majority of time have been for prosecution. Okay. Um, at this time, Your Honor, I've attended the witness. Okay, more time. No. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Mr. Knappinger, are there two exhibits in front of you? Uh, an electropharogram defense composite exhibit 2A and 2B, which is the uh, profiler plus and co-filer electropharogram for the swab of uh, Angel Avila's buckle swab? Uh, yes, sir. And is there also a buckle swab itself in front of you? What's been marked as Defense Exhibit 10? It may not be marked yet. This? Yeah, that's it. Yes. Okay. Without objection, I would admit uh, two, composite 2A two and B and 10 at this time, Your Honor. Be admitted. Um, Mr. Knoppinger, can you tell me what happens or what would happen generally when a buckle swab gets sent to a lab? Um, so buckle swab, when it gets sent, a um, small little cutting is taken from the cotton tip swab, which is generally what we receive. Um, that's extracted, DNA is extracted from that. Uh, certain locations are amplified, and the subsequent end result is a DNA profile is developed. Okay, and uh, the electropharogram that you have there, the Profiler Plus and Co-Filer page for the profile developed for Mr. Avila. Um, have you reviewed that? Yes, I've seen this, yes. Okay, and I want to talk to you about your analysis as it pertains to Look at that electropharogram as well? Yes, sir, I have. Okay. Already in evidence is defense composite 1A and 1B. The pro profiler plus page is A, the co-filer page is B. Um, so we say 1A and B, and say it's exhibit 35 are the same? They're the same, yes, sir. Okay. Um, Mr. Knoppinger, can you, uh, can you tell me about the analysis you performed? as it pertains to this evidentiary exhibit and comparing Mr. Avila's profile? Well, I compared uh, the DNA profile that was developed from him uh, to this electropharogram to see if uh, it could be included or excluded as a possible contributor. Okay. And um, 
you've had an opportunity to uh, to review Joel and Brown's findings as it pertains to this evidentiary exhibit as well, correct? Yes, sir. And uh, with respect to the calls she made relative to the different allele that showed up on the electropharogram, did you agree with everything that she found and determined? Yes, sir, I did. Now, you went a step further, correct? Yes, sir. And you actually did inclusion statistics for Mr. Avila? Well, it wasn't so much for, yes, yes, I did, from, from the electropharogram. Okay. Um, let me ask you that first. Did you make any determination about whether Mr. Avila was included as a contributor to this mix, mixture? Yes, I could not exclude him as a contributor, yes. Okay. And um, you did a statistical likelihood of inclusion, correct? Just statistical analysis, yes. Okay. Can you tell me about that? Before we talk about the numbers, tell me what it means. Okay. <clears throat> Um, well, but if I could talk just briefly on that. Sure. Okay. Uh, it's a mixture of, of at least two people, um, appears to be two people on that mixture. Um, so what we look for is, um, and the profile, we could not exclude, um, could not exclude the victim from this particular sample. So we're looking at for what's foreign, the foreign DNA. Um, so right away from the second line down, you're going to see an X and a Y. On it, it's a locus we call amylogenin. Um, the, and the peak heights determine how much DNA is present. So you see a very tall peak height at the X and a very small one at the Y. So it indicates um, the major contributor would be a female, and there is another contributor in this DNA sample that would be a male as well. So comparing the major contributor, I could not exclude her, so I was looking for the foreign, the foreign DNA that is, that is not her DNA. So from those foreign alleles, I took those foreign alleles and did a statistical calculation. Okay, let me clarify this first, I guess. Um, Brandy Peters was determined to be the uh, major contributor to this mixture, is that right? Yes, sir. And um, with respect to Javante Segura and Mr. Henry Segura, the defendant, they were both excluded from the mixture, correct? Um, yes, sir. Okay. Um, now as it relates to the foreign DNA, can you tell me what the statistical likelihood of inclusion for Mr. Avila was? Uh, yes, it, well, the lowest, it, we break it down into racial groups. Um, the Caucasian was about 1 in 1,200 people. The uh, African American was 1 in about 600. And the Hispanic was approximately around 1 in 15,000 uh, would be the frequency. OK. And what that means is that you would expect to see those alleles present in only one person out of whatever the other corresponding number is, correct? Yeah, it's a conservative number, yes. And so for Hispanics, you said it's one Hispanic and 15,000 Hispanic will have that foreign profile. Statistically, you would expect at least that, yes. Okay, so an inverse way of stating that would be that um, in any given genetic population, about 99.5% of the Hispanic population as it's 14,999 don't have that profile would be excluded from the profile, correct? Uh, about that, yes. Okay. That'd be correct. No further questions at this time. Well, Mr. Knopfler, isn't it true that in order for you to make the determination that Mr. Veal is present in this DNA, you had to assume more than two donors? Um, well, I assumed two donors on that sample. You assumed more than two, did you not? Well, there's one allele that. Uh, it did not match up to him, yes. There's one allele that didn't match to him, correct? That's correct. So in order to make a match for him, you would have to assume that there's two donors, correct? Another person out there. Well, we, in the forensic field, we, uh, be because of various issues that appear, we have to have at least two alleles. That's right. And well, you didn't have that second allele, correct? We only had one foreign, not two foreign. Okay. And uh, so you had to assume, again, an additional donor that would account for that extra allele, would you not? Well, I, I assumed two donors, but there was one allele that uh, did not fit that scenario. But again, so there were four, there would have to be a third donor. No, sometimes we have artifacts, or it could be um, a allele, it could be a allele from another donor, yes. Sometimes there's electrical issue or artifacts. That's why we are, we are positive we see two foreign alleles that, that it is, would be a third person. So it's in that gray area. Okay. But in order to make your gray area work for Mr. Avila, in order to get your calculations, you would have to assume that there's either an artifact there or an additional donor, correct? 
Well, I didn't actually assume that. I, I took um, from the FDLE analyst what she marked as foreign alleles, and that's where I did the statistical calculation from, more so from the, than the electropharogram. I did look at the electropharogram. Okay, but you found an allele that wasn't accounted for by Mr. Avila or the victims of the crime, correct? Yes, sir. So you would have to assume that another person donated that allele for some sort of historical artifact. Yes. And Ms. Brown assumed that there's only two donors, correct? In your report, yes. And you are paid by the defense, are you not? Yes. How much are you paid by the defense? Uh, I get paid through the state, but uh, I've been approved for the whole thing for like five thousand dollars. But but that's travel and expenses and those kind of issues. Redirect. Maybe one clarification. So there's uh, certain standards that have to be met in order to call it a two-person uh, sample, correct? Yes. Um, one of those requirements is that you have four allele present at a particular locus, correct? Well, for two person, uh, two person, the guidelines are you you have you inherit one allele from your mother, one from your father, so you have two. So a mixture uh, would be would be considered three alleles at two or more loci, is what protocols call for. Okay, that would be considered a two person mixture. And, and as you indicate, there is um, some gray area between, <coughs> for example, calling something a two person mixture and calling something a three-person mixture, is that right? Again, the protocol would be because of two alleles at each person, you would expect five alleles if it's three-person at two or more loci. Okay. Um, and there can be an in-between as well, right? You, you can have a situation where um, FDLE phrases as, as at least two, where you have two identifiable donors and then potential contribution by third, some third party that doesn't rise to the level of a clear-cut three-person mixture, right? Yes, sir. And so that's what we're talking about? In my opinion, yes, sir. Okay. And based on your opinion, you were able to determine that uh, Angel Avila was included as a contributor to the profile developed, the mixed profile developed from the swap of the foam cradle and Brandon's bedroom? Yes, sir. Thank you. No further questions at this time. Right. Hey, Jerry, I have a question at this witness. All right. You can step in. Do you need to keep him any further? Yes, sir. All right. Remain with us, please. Your next witness. This time, Your Honor. Yes, I do. Have a seat. Slide up the rail, please. May I proceed? Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Bundy, can you please state and spell both your first and last name, please? My name is Jason Bundy, J-A-S-O-N-B-U-N-D-Y. And what do you do for a living? I'm currently the Forensic Quality Manager for the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. What does that mean? The Forensic Quality Manager oversees um, all the quality assurance roles within the department uh, for all the disciplines that we do in forensics. Uh, it would cover training oversight, uh, quality assurance, procedure creation, etc. Okay. Does that apply to areas of forensic science beyond DNA? Uh, all of the disciplines, yes. So okay. DNA is included. All right. And uh, tell us about your educational background as well as training and experience you've received to be able to do that job. Uh, my training experience, I have a master's degree in biochemistry. Uh, my background in forensics is in the biology or the DNA testing, uh, where I completed DNA testing for about 15 years. You did that with, all with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement? 
All with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, yes. Okay. <laughs> and um, what was the last supervisory position you had specifically <clears throat> dealing with DNA? Uh, the last supervisory position I had was biology technical leader. It was a supervisory level position that is similar to the, the position I'm doing now, but only for biology. So it was the same quality assurance, but it was just biology centric. And uh, what region did you preside over? Uh, I presided over multiple laboratories during that time. It varied over the years that I did it, um, but I covered at least every laboratory that FDLE has at some point during that time. Okay. So you were basically the guy in charge of all the DNA analysts, correct? Uh, yes, over different times, but I wouldn't say the analysts so much as the uh, techniques and the requirements that we would be required to do more than the people themselves. Yes, sir. Um, your job was more aimed at uh, ensuring reliable results and reliable procedures and practices. Exactly. Okay. <clears throat> and so at, at various points throughout your career and uh, throughout your experience, you've been over every lab in the state of Florida that the Florida Department of Law Enforcement operates. At some point, yes. Okay. And because you're employed by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, you can't be hired as a contractor by, like if I wanted to hire you, I can't just come hire you. I, you work for FDLE. Uh, that is correct. Okay. And um, just for clarity's sake, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement Biology Section receives um, all evidentiary exhibits from law enforcement agencies and state attorney's office that they need tested for criminal cases, correct? Uh, yes, the, we receive from law enforcement agencies. Okay. And um, have you had an opportunity to testify based on your training, experience, and education as an expert in the field of DNA analysis previously? Yes, I have. And approximately how many occasions? About 30 times. Okay. I would tend to witness this. <coughs> hey, four times. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, I suppose it, it also bears asking. Um, I know you haven't testified as many times because you were more uh, more concerned within your role as a supervisor with make, making sure everybody was following uh, reliable practices and procedures. How many cases roughly have you worked on? Um, I, I probably worked at least a thousand cases. Okay. I'd like to ask you specifically about um, a profile or, or partial profile developed from Defense Exhibit 12, which is already in evidence. Uh, it was Agency Exhibit 126, FDLE 116, which is a swab of the bath bar in this case. Did you conduct analysis on that? I reviewed this, yes. Okay. <coughs> Yes, I do. And I'm going to ask you, I guess, generally for your, um, if it would be of assistance as a pointer. Oh, thank you. For your interpretive finding first, and then I'm going to go back and ask some specific questions of you. Um, ultimately, did you determine that this partial profile was interpretable? Uh, no, this particular profile uh, was not suitable for interpretation. Okay, so a finding that uh, Mr. Segura would be in reliable uh, and tested practices and procedures within the scientific community. It's definitely not approved in the Florida Department of Law Enforcement's procedure, uh, and that was something that we tested, so it doesn't fulfill any of the requirements of our validations or our procedures. Let's talk a little bit about that so we can understand that first. Um, there's a two-step process for validation of a kit, correct? Yes. Um, can you tell the jury about that? So generally, any time a new method or test is being completed, uh, a lot of our tests are created by uh, a, a company, a vendor, we'll call them. And so they will have to do an initial set of validation, which would be called the developmental validation. So they do extensive research in creating the product that they're gonna, we're going to end up using in forensics. Uh, once it's completed and they've developmentally validated and it's uh, met all the expectations at that level, for a laboratory to be able to use it themselves, they would have to validate it internally based on the procedures and the parameters that they intend to use it for, so that way we know the expected results that we would be able to achieve. So those two steps would be required at least for every method or test. And why is it that a second step of validation, an internal validation, is required for each lab? Because the instruments that are used in, particularly in DNA testing, but in a lot of different tests, they have multiple variables that you can change of time, 
temperature, voltage, different things like that in other settings that would impact the outcome of the results. So uh, an internal validation by the laboratory would be required so we would be able to ensure that we're getting reliable results with the parameters we've chosen. And uh, in the general sense, I suppose, what would happen if somebody just ignored the internal policies and procedures as it pertains to DNA interpretation, failing to take into account all the variables you just mentioned? If you don't follow to what was found in the validation, you make you may make conclusions that don't align with the expected results. So you could potentially um, make comparisons to data that's not trustworthy. It could be something other than DNA because that is part of the test itself that could happen. So you would have to, you, you wouldn't know necessarily what parameters to use for your interpretation if you didn't know what the procedure and the validation is set up. Now, there are some labs in other places that have a lower inclusion threshold, right? Some labs, for example, um, would have a 75 RFU uh, threshold for inclusion. Is that right? That is correct. But that would be based on totally different variables than are present with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. Is that also correct? Exactly. We, we don't know. That's the whole point. Okay. And <clears throat> let me ask you about SWIGDAM. Can you, uh, can you explain to the jury what SWIGDAM is? SWIGDAM is the scientific working group for DNA analysis method, uh, methods. Excuse me. It's a group uh, created by the FBI, and their sole intention was to create consistent and reproducible guidelines and practices that ensure trustworthy work coming out of forensic laboratories. And is one of the SWIGDAM requirements for interpretation that an individual interpreting data developed using a particular kit in a particular lab use the interpretive guidelines that were validated for use with that kit in that lab? Yes, I think the language specifies that to be able to do any interpretation, a lab must validate it. Okay. And so the lab, for example, wouldn't be able to validate inclusion on start allele with Profiler Plus, correct? Correct. Um, because that would be uh, not only a violation of SWIGDAM, but of the interpretive guidelines developed for use with Pro Profiler Plus and validated by FDLE, correct? It is not supported by the FDLE procedures, that's correct. Okay. Now, um, in order for such an interpretation, that is to say, an interpretation of start allele developed using Profiler Plus in an FDLE lab, uh, what type of other information could potentially be relevant to determining um, a reliable opinion and, and to do inclusion on low, va low RFU value allele? Does that make sense? No, if you could ask okay. it one more time. <clears throat> um, so um, I guess let me ask you this question first. Is general knowledge about the, uh, the way that the molecules that make up um, the DNA or the biological material present at each locus, is that particularly relevant to determining whether you can make a call on a start allele? Or, or is the analysis more based on the variables in the instrumentation? Uh, it does require both. You have to understand how the test itself works, uh, but that's also what we use to determine what parameters and the types of values of the parameters we're going to use. So it's very difficult to separate the two together. They, they kind of go hand in hand. Okay. And uh, what did the protocols in 2011, what did the protocols uh, or interpretive guidelines for Profiler Plus dictate with respect to inclusion? Uh, the threshold or the value that you would have to achieve as far as how much DNA you'd have uh, was 100. We, uh, the value was RFU, which is a refractive unit, so it's 100. Okay, and for, uh, for exclusion, what was the threshold? 50 in the same unit. Okay, and so at that time, it would have been inappropriate to do inclusion on uh, any allele that was less than 100 RFUs, correct? That's correct, per our procedures. Uh, and that would, uh, to do so would be a violation of the SWIGDAM requirements, <laughs> correct? It's a bit of an extrapolation, but uh, yes. I mean, to the extent that SWIGDAM requires anybody doing a, uh, analysis of a data set developed within a particular lab on a particular kit, it would violate that principle, correct? Correct. They're not doing it to validate the work okay. on that instrumentation. Because that, that instrumentation has been extensively tested on all those different variables you talked about within that particular lab, correct? Correct. And the instrumentation itself has a big <coughs> impact on the test results that are produced, correct? Absolutely correct. Okay. And in fact, 
uh, the kits are constantly being updated. Is that right? Uh, yes, they've changed many times over the years. And FDLE has used different kits over the years as well, correct? Absolutely. So, for example, after uh, Profiler Plus and Cofiler, FDLE switched to, as an example, Identifiler and Minifiler, right? Identifiler Plus, yes. Yes, sir. Um, so let, let's talk specifically about this data set right here. Um, in, uh, in a general sense, I want to talk about, I guess, amylogenin first. Uh, what, does the, what does the reading um, depicted on this electropherogram tell us about um, contribution to this mixture? <clears throat> amylogenin is this area here uh, that's labeled with an X and a Y. And what uh, amylogenin is is a gender marker. So um, generally, males have both an X and a Y, and a female will have two Xs. Uh, obviously, you don't see two Xs on the on the graph. It just makes the peak twice as tall. So in this particular instance, you see a very large X and a very small Y, which would tell me that I have a mixture of at least one female and one male. And what, if anything, does the peak proportion tell you? The 1,000. 41 RFUs for the X marker and 85 for the Y. Uh, that would designate to me that I would expect the female contributor of this to be larger than the male contributor. And the amylogenin marker is the easiest generally to amplify. Is that true? Easiest meaning you get the largest result, yes. yes so you, you would expect with an 85 value for the male marker, that any male DNA showing up in this sample is going to be very, very low level. Is that true? It is a low contribution, yes. And Which, that's going to be problematic for doing inclusion at any other locus, true? It's true because you would expect at least 100 to be able to use an inclusion, and if that's the largest peak you're going to get out of the set, then you would almost immediately guess that you're not going to have enough information to do inclusion on that male contributor. Okay. And I'd like to look at D3 next and, and use that as an example to talk about a general principle. Um, is it generally true that uh, peak proportions are going to be the same from a single contributor? Yeah, so what, what you're asking me, and when they're, because you get half of your DNA from your mother and half from your father, that potentially could be two different peaks on the graph, and because it's all my DNA, I would expect both of those peaks to be the same height or very close to the same height. And so as we have with uh, D3, we have a 15 showing up at 245 RFUs and a 17 at 246. Would that generally indicate contribution by one person? Y yeah, the, this one here is the one you're referring to. And yes, that, that is what I would expect for a single donor. Okay. And so um, if another person was contributing at that locus, and had, for example, 17-17, uh, you may see that 17 spiked way up high above the, the 15. Is that true? You would expect a bigger difference between the two, yes. And that could potentially be indicative of contribution by uh, another party. Is that correct? Yeah, it would potentially indicate a mixture to me. Okay. Um, I, I also want to uh, look carefully down at D5 and ask you in general about the dyes used to uh, during the amplification process and how that can potentially show up in skew results. Can you tell us about that? <clears throat> so each row on this graph uh, is separated for us to be able to see them in our test by a different dye. Um, so when we're doing our testing, they're separated from left to right by size and from up and down by color, by dye. So, um, Dyes may overlap, and so the test was created that you'll get the least amount of overlap between colors when you're trying to uh, achieve your result, but some, we know that there's overlap. Sometimes that shows up. So um, particularly in the third column, we know that we have a standard that's not shown on here uh, that sometimes has a very clear pattern that's identifiable sometimes in that third uh, row. Excuse me. And on the third row here, which encompasses... Uh, the locus is D5, D13, and D7. Um, when this sample was run on uh, Profiler Plus, uh, did it produce a dye pattern on the third row? It, it did. You can see a really obvious example of these two peaks here, uh, this single peak, and potentially that peak there, which don't line up to any of the areas of our testing, so it's obviously uh, impacted by that standard. Okay, and did that... Uh, 
also impact any of the peaks showing up under the listed locus? Yes, I considered that the contribution of this peak here uh, to include enough of it that it removed the ability to identify that peak as potentially also DNA. And um, when you say you could eliminate it as DNA, what does that mean exactly? Does that mean that <coughs> peak showing up is just dye and not actual biological material? Uh, what I mean by that is we had mentioned two thresholds, 50 being the minimum amount to identify it for exclusion or I, as a DNA peak at all, and then 100 is, is enough information that I would trust it to be able to do inclusion statistics to it. So because that peak that we're referring to is so low, and it's also in a position that that standard is, the amount of uh, DNA left over is expected to be less than that 50 because they're, they're overlapping. So I removed the label uh, to call it a DNA profile. So in any event, it would be able to be used for inclusion, but because of the dye, pull up on any biological material that's mm -hmm. present is likely below 50 and wouldn't be usable for any purpose. Is that correct? It, it can't be trusted. So yes, I removed it. OK. Um, can you tell us also in general about <coughs> how, how dropout can potentially impact reliable interpretation of a data set? Uh, dropout is is when uh, someone's DNA profile doesn't show up at every area that we test. Uh, you should expect for a single donor one or two peaks. Uh, if you get if once you start getting a low level DNA profile, the balance of those two peaks that we refer to also can get very broken, and sometimes the peak disappears altogether, and that's what dropout would be. So. Um, the, the dilemma is once you get below a certain level, you know that those things start to happen and it really sometimes confounds the ability to interpret the mixture, um, especially. So that can result in, if you try to interpret it, whether there's dropout present, it could result in false exclusion or false inclusion. Is that, that, that is possible, yes. Okay. Um, I also want to ask you in a general sense and as it relates to this specific data set, how interpretation can be complicated or rendered impossible or at least reliable <coughs> interpretation uh, based on contribution by multiple people who are related. <clears throat> As I mentioned a little bit ago, uh, you get half of your DNA from your mother and half from your father. So that means the same DNA types, you have at least half of each of your parents' DNA types. So if you were to see a mixture of me and one of my parents or me and one of my kids, it would barely look like two people because there's so much sharing going on. It would make it very, very difficult to determine what belongs to me versus um, uh, particularly parents and, uh, and offspring, but also even in siblings, we know that there's a tremendous amount of sharing. So particularly when you, you're looking to try and determine if parent or child uh, is included in a mixture such as this, um, it would be impossible, especially with dropout prevalent throughout the sample, to tell whose DNA is showing up at what locus. Is that right? It can be very difficult, yes. And that's why you ultimately determined that uh, this data set could not be reliably interpreted. Correct. And, and, and looking at this because it's so low and there's such a variety of peak heights, it's also very difficult to determine how many people could even be in the mixture because of the relatedness. Yes, sir. Um, let me also ask you about uh, the uh, genetic database information that FDLA maintains for frequency of occurrence, and, and please tell the jury what that means. <clears throat> so for us to be able to give an idea of how significant a DNA result is, we try and look at a database which would say how often uh, particular DNA profiles are found in the population. So uh, a simple way of looking at it is if you if you look at a, a coin and you flip it, it's, you only have two choices, heads and tails. So your database is obviously we know 50-50 as an average, but you could flip a coin twice and still get heads twice. doesn't mean that you'll always alternate between heads and tails, and so it's an average of how often you would see them in the population on a much bigger scale. And the, uh, the frequency of, of occurrence tables maintained by FDLE, um, which would be used to do statistics on any data set developed by FDLE, correct? Yes. We didn't create them. We used ones that were developed, but yes. Um, those frequencies of occurrence, though, are based on frequency of occurrence amongst unrelated individuals. Is that correct? It, it, absolutely. They're in, 
there's not supposed to be any relationship in the samples that are created for a database. So what happens to the statistical reporting if you're trying to report <coughs> frequency of occurrence with multiple family members contributing to the same mixture? So if I use the same analogy of the coin flipping and, and I pulled out some change from my pocket, you would expect that every one of those coins would be heads and tails. That's your random population. But if I knew family members were going to be in there, I could take some of those coins away and make heads on both sides. And so it would really skew the result of how many times I would see heads because it's so much more prevalent because some of them don't have tails at all. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> would it be appropriate in any way to use a bank of frequency of occurrence information based on unrelated individuals to determine frequency of occurrence amongst related individuals? It's not ideal because it's, uh, a statistic is meant to give you an idea of how significant or how rare it would be to find something, and it becomes much more common when you include related individuals. Sense, particularly with the parent and child, they necessarily share DNA, correct? Exactly. Half. Okay, um, can I ask you generally uh, about why FDLE switched from Profiler and Cofiler to Identifiler Plus? Absolutely. Uh, over time, technology improves. So those tests together had 13 areas that we were able to test. Uh, the next kit that became available that we switched to was called Identifiler Plus. It had 15, so it also included some improvements in the ability to get more sensitive data, it, that sort of thing. So as technology improves, sensitivity, the number of places to look, we, we would adjust to include the better identification. Were there any advantages <coughs> with identifying the screen further? Yes, I will. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, and if, if you aren't going to use the screen, go back to the photo. I'll, I'll go ahead and do that now. Okay. Um, may I approach the witness? You may. Let the record reflect. I'm going to show the witness what's marked for identification is defense 14. Can you tell me what, what that is? It's another electrophorogram for um, the same item, I think, but run through Identifiler Plus. Four years after the profiler copiler run, correct? That is correct. So a data set was developed from the swap of the bath bar on Identifiler as well. Yes, it was tested again. Okay. I'd like to talk to you. Uh, is that a true and accurate? Yes. Okay. At this time, Your Honor, I would request to move into evidence uh, this exhibit as Defense 14. Any objection? Your Honor. Be admitted. Mr. Fung, I'd like to ask you specifically about the results showing up at D5 down here in the bottom left corner. On the, uh, on the profiler page, you indicated that there was a, a dye pattern on the third row and that uh, that was potentially skewing some of the alleles being reported. Um, do you notice that some of the biological information that had showed up on profiler has fallen off at this locus on the second run? Uh, yes, there is a lot of actually m missing information on this compared to the previous one. Okay. And why does that happen? Uh, it could mean a bunch of different things. It could be um, the fact that it was an older sample and it wasn't. We weren't able to get the same level of testing. Um, it could mean um, a lot of different things, I suppose, degraded if, over time. If if, uh, if a sample <coughs> is maintained properly in a refrigerated state, as a swab generally would be with FDLE, um, can a lack of reported data also have to do with the fact that there was either white noise or um, stutter, for example, or a dye pattern showing up on one of the older instruments? Uh, it could potentially be some. It would be limited. It shouldn't be a ton of difference, but yes, there could be a, a little less noise in a, in a more uh, update kit. Okay. Right. I'm going to switch back to uh, profiler for a second. So you've had, a, you've had an opportunity to review uh, Mr. McElfresh's findings as it pertains to the swap of the bath bar, correct? Um, only vaguely. Okay. And are, are you aware that he did uh, inclusion statistics using the star 12 down at D5, the star 14 
down at D5 in the 16 up at D8. That is the only part that I am aware of, yes. Okay. <clears throat> and the only two allele foreign to the victims on the profiler page were the starred 12 at D5 and the starred 16 at D8. Is that correct? Uh, the only thing, yes, I'm, I'm pretty sure that is correct, yes. Those were the only two foreign numbers. Yeah. That, that, can you say who it was foreign to? Any of the families that you just said? The, the four victims. Yes, that is correct. And then, so when we switch over to the more modern kit, the Identifier Plus run, neither the 12 nor the 14 at D5 nor the 16 is showing up at D8. Is that correct? I don't see any of them, no. Thank you. No further questions. Cross, don't take it away. <laughs> don't take that away. Yeah, so we, it would be suitable for exclusion, but not inclusion. Okay. But we're really talking about a 98, correct? Yep. So the rules are hard and fast with FDLE, correct? Yes. But you would agree with me that swig dam aren't hard and fast rules. They are more of guidelines, correct? Uh, the entire process is a guideline, yeah, for okay. swig dam. All right. And you would agree that something, if this 12 was 100, there really isn't a whole lot of difference between 12, 100, and 98, is there? Uh, no, they're very close. Yeah. Okay. Now, there were a couple of issues with FDLE at the time about making hard and low RFU determinations or something along those lines with this case, right? Uh, I guess some. Yeah. And as a result, FDLE recommended that Dr. McElfresh uh, actually go back and review all of this stuff to make sure that FDLE was, in fact, interpreting things correctly, right? Um, I wasn't part of any of that discussion that I'm aware of. Okay. Just to ensure that FDLE uh, has a certain standard, correct? Our procedures do ensure consistency, yes. Okay. And that consistency standards that you uh, utilize are set up for the purposes, of course, the instruments are the instruments, right? Not sure. In I, part. I, okay. I heard a question in there. You're set up to make sure accuracy, consistency, yes. right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Instruments don't really vary once you do those establishments, correct? No, they, uh, we continually check them to ensure they don't drift. Right. You're also, as another part of the interpretation of standards for Florida Department of Law Enforcement, in order to ensure consistency, you also have analysts as well, correct? Yes, of course. And that's really a two-part system there. You've got the analyst that's reading the data and the instrument itself, correct? Absolutely. Instrument really isn't changing a whole lot. Instruments, the instrument's going to give you the readouts it gives you, right? Uh, yeah, you would expect them to be very consistent. Right. But you would also agree with me that Florida Department of Law Enforcement has different um, analysts of different educational levels, of different experience levels, and things along those lines, correct? Uh, yes, they all have all gone through the same uh, training program for interpretation in our procedures, though. But in making those interpretations, you would agree, once again, of course, that experience um, and 
certain situations and knowledge certainly goes towards interpretation of the data that's come out of the um, instrument, correct? Absolutely, experience is always gonna help, yes. Okay, and you really can't make a standard for say Jason Bundy who's got 15 years of experience but not necessarily, and have the exact same, uh, and excuse me, you can't have a different standard for Jason Bundy who's got 15 years of experience as you do from um, John Doe, who only has two to three years of experience, correct? You can't vary that? No, of course not. But that's because our training is meant to help fill in any space gaps of experience and, sure. the, and the limitations of the procedure. So both of them are intended to close the gap between levels of experience. And then you set those 100 RFU guidelines and the other guidelines that F uh, FDLE does to also aid in that as well, correct? Uh, thresholds aren't designed to change uh, the level of knowledge about what's happening so much as what the instruments are capable of. But it's also what the analysts are capable of, are they not? I would say the analyst portion is probably the ability to look at complex mixtures and stuff like that, such as this case, and be able to decipher what's in there, what could be impacting it. That's where experience probably plays more into anything else. Correct. So experience plays more into that than anything else, right? Okay. And certainly someone who has experience in dealing with ORFUs um, over a lifetime, um, as well as developing the databases and testing, would certainly have much more experience than those of FDLE, and therefore may be able to vary from those guidelines a little bit more than one of your analysts of John Doe, for instance, of three years. Well, the biggest difference would be that someone outside of FDLE is not limited to FDLE's SOPs or procedures. Then. Right. So that would change the rules altogether. Certainly, and I noticed that during your testimony, you're very, you're very specific that these rules apply to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. Someone who's not FDLE, they don't necessarily apply there, and it's not abnormal for them to vary a little bit in using their experience and education and making these interpretations of low RFUs, correct? Um, no, I would expect some variation on interpretation. And in fact, we have interpretation variances between you and Joe Allen Brown, correct? That's true. I noticed you eliminated one in your, making your determination, you eliminated one that she didn't. Correct. And just so we're clear, in taking a look at this example, item number 126, defense exhibit number 12, which also states exhibit number 63. And looking at this sample, and utilizing the FDLE guidelines, mm -hmm. you cannot eliminate Henry Segura as being a donation a donor to this particular profile. Can you? Well, I think the dilemma is that, again, based on our procedures and how DNA interpretation, even from Swig Dam, is recommended, is you have to look at the DNA results first and determine if something is interpretable or not before you make any comparisons. So knowing that when I've looked at this and said, I don't think this is interpretable because there are too many things that would confound interpretation, I never would have even gone and looked at the standards to determine if someone was included or excluded. Fair enough, but let's do a hypothetical that this in fact is something interpretable. All the alleles for, Flor for Henry Segura are present in this particular profile, are they not? Or at least to the point that you couldn't exclude him from it. there's enough overlap that I wouldn't automatically exclude, especially in a mixture. No further questions. Redirect. <coughs> well, well, Mr. Bundy, I don't think that anybody would dispute an analyst's experience is certainly important. The whole point of the validation study within a particular lab is focused on the variables inherent to the kit, correct? And you mentioned some of those variables. Uh, not just to the kit, but to the instruments we're running them on. And since we own those instruments and have changed those parameters, it, no one else would know what we've done to that instrument to, and the reasons why we set 
the thresholds that we set unless they've really paid attention to that information. And that's not something an outside analyst would generally have, correct? Uh, not that I'm aware of, no. Okay. And that's exactly the reason why SWGDAM requires that anybody interpreting a data set developed within a particular lab on a particular kit use the interpretive guidelines set by that lab. Is that right? Yes. That's exactly why. And in terms of uh, excluding Mr. Segura as a contributor, where you have a sample where potentially uh, somebody related to him is contributing and also have prevalent dropout throughout, um, can you explain why that would create a problem with excluding him? Uh, if there was offspring, for instance, in, in this mixture of his, half of all DNA types would be present, which would be enough for me to say exactly like I said a minute ago, that I wouldn't automatically exclude him from it. Yes, sir. Thank you. No further questions. All right. Any jury have a question at this point? <coughs> all right. You can step down. Do we need to keep him further? Uh, I would keep him under the rule. Okay. Speak, be on call. Remain under the rule. Okay. <coughs> Next witness. All right, this time the defense would like to call Joe Allen Brown. Okay. Oh, but we haven't dealt with what we did last right. few minutes. Right. You need to call somebody else. Okay. Well, we take 10 minutes. We're going to be close to break time.
Stipulation: We're going to play Tamika Hawkins' former testimony. There's a transcript on the bench for the court and for each of the jurors in the state. Um, we just needed to uh, have the court adjust the volume and make sure that's working before we brought the jury out. Okay. And do you want me to say anything as to why we're doing this? By uh, I, I would like that, yes, sir. Um, and it doesn't have to be very specific. It's family medical emergency that prevented her from being personally present. Yeah. have a problem with John she had a medical problem that's why we're using this yes, okay. uh, if you want to play it just a moment and see yes, I, don't, I don't know that I control that body we'll we did call IP so they should be down in a second if Mike is here judge huh? uh, if you tried it and it didn't sound right he's playing right now no sound is on okay we separated out the controls, so I would only have the, these microphones. Uh, have the attorneys muted? That would change effectively.
computer played on the computer next to the microphone. So they wouldn't get the video. Yeah. <laughs> if we can't get them on here, I know there's uh, other witnesses that I can talk to that I can get if you want to hear something that's not very loud. Move on to another witness. Yes. We do this end of the day, Mike. Okay. Yes. Figure it out. Yes. Other witnesses. We'll need to take the video down, Mike. Set up so that can project up. Yeah, where, are we, where are we going to project from? That's your thing. Okay. Yeah. Let's have a jury, please. Got your next one? Yes, sir. She's coming. All rise for the jury. All right, everybody be seated. Sorry, we had a technical problem, delayed things. Uh, just retrieve those transcripts, if you would, Deputy. We were going to play a video. And we can't get that to work, so we're going to move on to something else. Um, we'll play with that later. Mr. Prince. This time we are under the defense of recall of Joe Allen Brown. All right, come forward, Mr. Prince. Good afternoon. My name is Joe Ellen Brown. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Ms. Brown, since you were on the stand last, you had an opportunity to uh, analyze Mr. Avila Canona's uh, electropharogram and compare it for possible inclusion uh, to the mixed profile developed um, on defense composite exhibit 1A, 1B, which is the swab uh, of the foam cradle from the victim's house, is that right? Yes. Um, Before we get into what your finding is, um, I'd like to kind of go through and uh, have you explain the numbers that you used to, to do inclusion and, and why you arrived at that uh, opinion. So we'll look at the profiler page first. Um, ultimately, based on the um, foreign uh, allele numbers showing up here, that is uh, numbers foreign to the victims. Um, were you able to do inclusion to the mixture for Mr. Avila Quinones? Yes. Okay. Uh, and can you tell us which alleles that you used at the various locus to do that? Well, I was looking at the minor donor. 
and the major donor is consistent with Brandy. So, uh, at D3, there's a 1517, and that's Brandy's type. So I called the minor donor inconclusive. Generally speaking, because it's in this position, we would think that any minor donors alleles would show up. However, they could be masked by the 1517 of the major donor. Does the, uh, does the fact that there's a slight peak disproportion there, even if it's still within the accepted percentage ranges for a single donor, um, is that what you mean when you say it could be masked? For example, the 17 is roughly 100 RFU higher. Could we that difference is insignificant in, oh, okay. in terms of trying to include another person. Okay. However, um, I just would say that Mr. Avila Quinones at D3 is a 1517 as well. So no determin determination could be made about him at Correct. that? Correct. Okay. Correct. So here at BWA, I have a 14, 15, 17, 18. The two major peaks are 15, 18 and that's consistent with Brandy's type. The minor component is 14 and 17. However, I'm taking into consideration that the 14 could be from the girls because this peak right here, 15, normally there will be a small peak right in front of the first peak. Um, that's just a product of the multiplication that we do um, through the PCR process. It's uh, called stutter. Can, can you uh, tell the jury just a little bit more about what's, what stutter is and how it occurs? Well, stutter is just a kind of an artifact of um, amplifying the DNA. It's just one repeat short of the main peak, and it's recognized that it happens. If we had bigger peaks, we would be able to see more of the stutter. But these peaks are so small that we don't see it. And the reason, so part of this 14 peak is probably stutter from this peak, which is 624 RFUs. However, that would not account for all 134 RFUs from this peak. So it must have been coming from someone else. Could have come from the girls. I was considering the kind of thing that came from their home could have their DNA on it. Um, however, there's not enough of their profile in this mixture, total mixture, for me to be able to say they're included. However, I was still taking into account that it's possible that some of the 14 would come from them. Anyway, Mr. Avila Quinones at VWA is 1718. Okay. So out of these four alleles, there, are, there is a 17 and 18. So he would be included there. And there are no alleles that are stars. So this is one that could be used for statistics. All right. At FGA, I have a 21, 24, 25, and 26. The major component is 24, 26, and that's consistent with Brandy's type. So the minor component is 21, 25, <laughs> although both of these are starred alleles. So this locus I would not be able to use for statistics. And Mr. Uh, Avila Quinones type is 2125. Right. Amylogenin does indicate that there's some male contribution there because there's a Y much smaller than the X. At <coughs> D8, there is an 11, 12, 15. Um, Brandy's type is 11, 15 that's represented there. And the 12 is a minor. And Mr. Avila Quinones type at D8 is 1212. So he would be included there. And there are no starred alleles there, so I could use this locus also for statistics. Yes. At D21, the only peaks showing up are the major peaks, which are 25, 28. So I called the minor inconclusive here. For D18, the major component is 1719, which is consistent with Brandy's type. So 
The minor component is an 18, that D18. And Mr. Avila Quinones' type is 1518. Now there's no 15 there that we can see because these are very, very low. The 18 is only at 79 RFUs. And again, what I called the minor component is 18 plus. And plus means that it's possible that there's another allele that could have dropped out since this is so low. And we're on the far right side of the, uh, the graph there, so we would expect more dropout than on the left side, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, at the next locus, which is D5, I have a 7, 11, and 12. And again, I mentioned the first time I testified that the girls had this kind of rare allele, which was a 7, at D5, so I wanted to consider that their 7, which is only at 78 RFUs, might be showing up there. So Brandy's type is 1111, so that's the major type. And Mr. Quinones's, Avila Quinones's type at D5 is 1112. So he's, he would be included there, but I could not use this for statistics because there are starred alleles there. The 7 and 12 are below 100 RFUs. That's likewise why the girls can't be included, because both of the uh, locusts were there potentially showing up or start allele. Right. Okay. All right. As I also said before, we can use start alleles to eliminate people or exclude people, but not to include them. Yes, ma'am. Um, at D13, the alleles I found were 11 and 12. Um, Brandy's type is 1111, so the 12 is minor. And Mr. Avila Quinones at D13 is 1112, so he would fit in there. Then there were no results at D7 on Profiler Plus, but there are on Cofiler. This is again D3, which was on the profiler, the first one on profiler, and it gives the same results, 15, 17, which is consistent with Brandy, and I called the minor inconclusive. The next one is D16, at which I have a 9, 11, 13, and Brandy's type is 9, 13, so the minor component is an 11 plus. Mr. Avila Quinones at D16 is... 9, 11. Right. I could not use this for um, statistics because there, the 11 is a starred allele. At TPOX, the alleles I recovered are 7, 8, and 9. We're talking about THO right there? Oh, I'm sorry. THO, correct. Yes, the major component is 7-7, seven, seven, and Brandy's type is 7-7. Seven, seven. So the minor component is 8 and 9. But the, the 9 is a start allele, so I could not use this for statistics. Mr. Avila Quinones at the 1 is 8-9. That's his type. The next one is T-Pox, and I have a... An 8, 9, 10 alleles at that locus. The major is brandy at 8 and 10, so the minor is a 9 plus. And Mr. Avila Quinones at TPOX is 9, 11. So his 11, as we're going across the screen again from left to right, is dropping out there. Yes, this 9 is only at 66 RFUs. So it's possible that the allele that goes with it has dropped out. At CSF, I have only an 1114, which is Brandy's type, and therefore I called the minor inconclusive. At D7, D7 I have 11, or I'm sorry, 10, 11, 12. Brandy's type is 1112. 
that is the major, and the minor would be a 10 plus. And at D7, Mr. Aquila Quinones is 8, 10. So based on that, I did include him as a possible contributor. Um, the rules for FDLE's inclusion is that it must have a, a statistic to go with it if it's an inclu inclusion. And the two loci that I mentioned I could use that did not have any start alleles for statistics would be VWA and D8. However, I could not calculate a statistic now because I don't have access to the software that does that. Okay, so we can't say frequency of occurrence that you can determine based on um, callable uh, allele for inclusion purposes. That is allele that are above 100 RFUs. We can say that Mr. Avila is included as a contributor to that mixture, is that right? Yes, and it is significant to me that even the start alleles, he has um, those alleles also. And, and if the start alleles had not matched, you would have been able to exclude him on the basis of those. It's proper to use start allele, star alleles for exclusion, correct? Yes, that's correct. And even with all those start alleles that we saw, um, none of them were inconsistent with his profile such that he would be excluded. That's correct. Okay. Um, I was going to ask you briefly about a couple of exhibits real quickly here that were not in evidence when you testified before. Um, in evidence now is Defense Composite Exhibit 23, A, uh, A through E. These are some latex gloves that were found at Tom Brown Park. Um, do you have your report wherein those, um, those gloves were processed? What would the TPD number be? Uh, TPD exhibits 7A through 11A, FDLE 175 through 179. <coughs> For the TPD uh, Exhibit 11A, I did not get any DNA results. Um, it did test positive for blood, though, correct? Yes. Okay. Are these the latex gloves? Yes, sir. Uh, of the composite exhibit that's the E designation. Um, the submitting agency, TPD, never requested uh, touch DNA testing for any of those exhibits, correct? And so none was performed? I'm sorry, what was the question? I was just asking, you tested for, uh, for blood, you swapped the blood, but no touch DNA was uh, was touch DNA swabs were taking. In other words, the glove wasn't turned inside out and swabbed on the inside for possible touch DNA. Well, just a minute. I'll have to find that. That's correct. Okay. And there was also a, a possible hair identified with that exhibit. Is that correct? Five possible hairs. And the, the submitting agency, TPD, didn't request that any of those be tested, correct? Correct. And since there was blood evidence, the hairs were not considered to be more probative than the blood. Right. Okay. And then um, switching to what's in evidence is defense composite 24A through F. Um, it's TPD 12A with no designations for the individual gloves, FDLE 180. They listed six gray gloves from Jack McLean. You identified seven within the packaging. Correct. Um, and you were able to identify blood on at least one of those? And you, you said 24, that's 25, right?
What was your question? You were able to identify blood on at least one of those, is that correct? Yes, on three of them. Okay. And um, there was enough there to get um, at least a partial profile with some start alleles so that you could do exclusion? From eight areas of the gloves, I had no DNA results. And I had some limited DNA results from one area of the gray gloves. Limited basically means I can exclude, but I cannot include people. Okay. And uh, you were able to exclude all four victims and Mr. Segura from being a contributor to that uh, partial profile, correct? That's correct. <coughs> Looking at my report. <laughs> this is the one, it was the electrofarogram that you were talking, uh, Mr. Prince, about. Yes. I have it in a different file, I'm afraid. It's a little complicated. They have hundreds of samples that are looking at. It's a little bit It was a mixture of DNA, which was a, indicated the presence of at least two individuals. If I assumed two individuals to the mixture, I was able to determine the major, which matched Brandy, and had a partial DNA profile for the minor contributor. I excluded the children, Tanaya, Tamaya, and Javante, as possible contributors. Although I might have included them if those alleles had been above the uh, callable limit. Are they there or are they not? Because alleles that are consistent with some of the, the girls especially are starred alleles, I can't say they are included. In looking at making a determination about whether or not one or more persons are present, two persons versus three persons, isn't it true that when you're looking at one particular person, Typically, when you're talking about more than two persons, you're looking at instances with three, uh, or I mean, there are five or six peaks. That's not true in this case. Okay. In this case, though, you assume two donors, correct? Correct. Okay. One of those is Brandy. Correct. And then, of course, the other one is the minor contributor. And we see right here at BWA, the minor you concluded was a 14 and a 17. Yes, but as I explained, I was trying to take into consideration that the girls 14 might have shown up at VWA. Or it could be the minor contributor that you labeled here with the four peaks as being a 14 or 17, correct? It might be. Okay. And Mr. Avila doesn't have a 14, does he? No, he doesn't. And Brandy does not have a 14, does he? Does she? 
the sheet? The sheet, excuse me. No. Okay. So uh, your original conclusion was the minor is a 1417, and if in fact the minor is 1417, Mr. Vila cannot be that minor, can he? Because he is a 1718. Well, in my opinion, it was important to take into a consideration that this was off of a phone, which was in the home, that the children might have touched, but there might not have been enough DNA for me to be able to say they're included. There were some alleles which were start alleles that if they had been higher, I could have included them. But according to the rules of FDLE, I cannot use those starred alleles to include anyone. Okay. Let's talk about peak proportionality that Mr. Prince talked about previously. When you're talking about someone of a mixture in this situation in which there are in fact two donors, one of which the major of 1518, those peaks are proportionate to each other, correct? Consistent yes. Consistent with being the same? Yes. The minor and the 1417 are proportionate to each other in the fact that they are roughly the same amount, correct? That... That is correct, however, that there's different interpretations of that. Certainly. And let's talk about interpretations. You're no longer with Florida Department of Law Enforcement, are you? Pardon me? You are no longer with Florida Department of Law Enforcement, are you? I have retired. Okay. And in fact, that retirement was requested because of the fact that your handling of this very same exhibit number 33, was it not? No. It was not? No. All the issues that were created out of the, these exhibits at the phone cradle is not a part of that retirement aspect. No. Okay. Let's talk again, if we will. Let's move on to D5. D5, you made a determination that the minor was a 7 and a 12, correct? I did, not, deter I did not determine that a single minor person had both the 7 and the 12. Okay, but you made the determination that the major was an 11-11, correct? Yes. Okay. And you made a determination that there are two donors, correct? You have to say what you are assuming in order to interpret the mixture. Okay. If I was able to do it according to how I felt, I would have said there were, in fact, I said in my report, at least two donors. Which is not the children, is what you said in your report, correct? Well, if you remember what I said, I would have included the children if I could have. However, the rules of FDLE are that if there are starred alleles, you cannot use those for inclusion. So what, what I therefore had to say that they were excluded. Correct. They were excluded. So if you make, if you exclude them, and the major is an 1111, and the minor is a 712, Mr. Avila is an 1112, correct? He's not a 712, is he? But he is included. Out of those three alleles, he is included in those three. But he's not included in that fourth one, is he? Which if you have two donors, you've got four alleles. No, sir, that's not correct. something wrong on this case. Um, can you tell the jury what CODIS is? Yes, CODIS stands for Combined DNA Indexing System. 
It is a computerized um, accumulation of both crime, crime scene uh, evidence and also um, standards from convicted offenders that are all the, the alleles that you see that are developed, the 13 alleles, are put into CODIS and they can be searched against each other. So for instance, an unsolved crime that has a particular DNA profile might match to a convicted offender. And even back in uh, 2010 and 11 and 12 when these samples were initially run, there were millions and millions and millions of offenders in the national database for CODIS, correct? I believe so, yes. Okay. Um, you were the, actually the CODIS administrator at that time for the Tallahassee Biology Lab, is that correct? Yes. And, and can you tell the jury what a CODIS administrator is? Uh, the C CODIS administrator checks to see what kind of matches may have happened when your DNA samples that had been entered that week um, were searched against the database. And once they are determined, we have them confirmed by a section of the laboratory called the DNA database. And then we send out letters to the agencies tell them, telling them that we have uh, identified the profile that was found at the crime scene. At least that's what the FDLE operating procedures required, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and, and can you tell the jury the difference between the requirements for the local CODIS database, the statewide, and then the national database? There are different numbers of loci required to be able to be searched. Um, ten are required to search at the national level. I believe it's still seven are required to be searched at the local level. What that means is local level means that you're searching the DNA profiles con made up in your own lab, or I mean determined by your own lab. Then there's a state search which tries to match your DNA profile from your evidence against all the state um, profiles that have been uploaded. And finally, the third stage is to search your DNA profile at the national level. And uh, to enter a sample into the national level, it requires uh, the largest number of, of loci present, correct? Correct. So you'd have to have a more of a profile to enter it in the national database. Correct. And as the CODIS administrator, for the Tallahassee lab, you were the person who knew those guidelines best and was kind of the gatekeeper as to which samples would go into each of the three levels of the database, is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, and you actually did enter this sample, the one that we were just talking about, the swab of the foam cradle, into the national database because it met the criteria, correct? I did. And you got a hit? Yes, I did. Okay. And um, when you get a hit, what is supposed to happen? Um, the CODIS administrator is supposed to write a, um, a report to the agency that submitted the evidence telling them that you have matched, uh, you either matched to another case or you matched to a person in the database. And um, the submitting agency then can request a buckle swab from that individual, right? That's correct. In any event, it's an investigative lead that the, invest that the submitting agency is supposed to be apprised of. Correct so that that information can be provided to the state attorney and ultimately the defense, correct? <coughs> well, I'm not sure what all they do with it, but we have to uh, inform the agency, yes. And uh, that isn't a discretionary call, that's something that was specifically provided for in the FDLE operating procedures, correct? Yes. With which you were especially familiar as the CODIS administrator. Yes. Um, when you got a hit for this particular sample, um, did anyone prevent you from complying with FDLE operating procedures and providing to the Tallahassee Police Department notice of the investigative lead, notice of the hit? Yes, I had written a letter. Um, my supervisor take, took a look at the profile, saw that there were a lot of starred alleles there, and took it to his supervisor, who was the chief of forensics at FDLE at the Tallahassee lab. And she told me to not send the letter. Um, that was Karen Martin, right? Her name is Karen Martin, correct. How much experience did Karen Martin have relative to you? She had more experience than me. Um, but you were the CODIS administrator, right? Correct. <coughs> okay. And um, it was ultimately determined that her failure to notify the agency, or, or differently stated, I suppose, um, for preventing you from properly notifying the submitting agency in accordance with FDLE operating procedure was a violation of those procedures, correct? Yes. 
And to correct that problem, you yourself actually had to go notify Mr. Campbell, the state attorney handling the case at the time, to see that the defense was notified of the investigative lead. Is that right? I took it upon myself to um, verbally telephone him and tell him about it, yes. And if not for you going out of the way to comply with FDLE's operating procedures, uh, that lead could have gone um, unknown to everybody, unknown to the state attorney, Mr. Campbell, and unknown to the defense. Correct. And that would have prevented Mr. Campbell effectively from utilizing law enforcement research, uh, resources to get the buckle swab from Mr. Avila. He probably would not have. Yes, ma'am. And just to be clear, uh, although you're no longer employed by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, it had nothing to do with your compliance with the standard operating procedures, correct? You just retired because you'd finished your career. I retired because I reached the age of 62 and I wanted to retire. Yes, ma'am. Uh, similarly, with respect to your testimony here today, the party paying your expert witness fee is the state attorney, correct? Correct. You're not being paid a single dime by the defense, correct? Well, I could bill you for an expert. You could bill me. <laughs> Fair enough. You haven't been paid anything, right? I have not been paid anything yet. And you have not submitted a bill to me, correct? Correct. Thank you. No further questions. Hey, Jerry, I have a question. All right, you can step down. Do we need her further? All right, you're excused. Thank you. Sorry, next question. Kevin Noppinger. You may proceed, Mr. Yeah. Up on the screen here, Mr. Noppinger, we have what's been entered into evidence as uh, Defense Exhibit 12. It's the uh, profiler page of the swab of the bath bar. Um, and I want to get your, your unique perspective on uh, one issue as it relates to the interpretation of this data. Um, we didn't really get into this before, but you were previously a lab accreditation auditor, correct? Yes, sir. Can you tell the jury what that means? <coughs> um, crime laboratories uh, in the U.S., uh, you have to be um, accredited, um, so you have to be audited. So part of that is I was on audit teams, uh, probably did probably 15 labs throughout the U.S. The inspectors go in, there's um, quality assurance guidelines, the FBI requires DNA laboratories in the U.S. to follow. So we would go in, ensure they do validation studies, have proper protocols, procedures, um, whole list educational requirements, uh, contamination logs, and we would go through the laboratories and audit them normally two to three days, depending upon the laboratory, how big they are, and um, make findings if they were in uh, not compliance with the FBI guidelines. And uh, if a lab was not in compliance with those guidelines, they could potentially lose accreditation, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, one example of an issue that could potentially lead to a lab losing accreditation is if they fail to follow the interpretive guidelines that were validated for use with their instruments. Is that true? Yes, sir. It would be a finding. Yes. Okay. And the reason is that um, those interpretive guidelines that are validated for use, that's not some kind of quick sloppy process, correct? Um, reliable results cannot be produced through interpretation that, is not, that are not based on the interpretive guidelines for use with that kit and instrument. Is that, is that correct? Yes, it takes months um, for a new kit uh, to validate. And can you talk about some of the variables relative to the instruments um, that may impact, for example, what the inclusion threshold would be for that particular instrument? 
You mean how you would go about doing that? Yes, sir. Um, well, when you do validation studies, you have to do studies on sensitivity. Uh, you have to do studies with mixtures, uh, two, three, four people mixture studies. Um, you look at baseline noise. The instruments have their, their electrical signals, baseline noise. There's some what we call spikes, electrical signals sometimes that come up. So you have to evaluate all of those criteria. Um, and after your validation studies, you make your standard operating procedures, your, your interpretation guidelines <coughs> that, that you've uh, developed from the validation study. Um, and so uh, you referred to um, some kind of static, also referred to as white noise. Can you tell the jury in a little more detail what that would mean and how it could potentially impact interpretation of peaks? <clears throat> well, it's, it's sort of like I said before, a mixture is when you, because you have two alleles, when you see three alleles at two or more loci, because sometimes you could get uh, some noise that might be there. So your reliability is better if you have at least two extra alleles. So um, again, it's, some are based on um, electrical signals, some are based on um, charges or, or artifacts that might be in different solutions or in the extraction. And, and those factors are gonna vary widely from instrument to instrument, kit to kit, is that, is that correct? Yes, as well as um, the way the substrate, the samples are taken too, it could. <coughs> and it's for that reason that SWIGDAM requires anybody interpreting a data set from within a lab with a particular instrument to follow that lab's guidelines because yep. those guidelines have been uh, uh, put in place to ensure reliable interpretation. Correct, their own laboratory guidelines, yes. And if somebody isn't aware of all of the different variables that can impact a reading uh, on a, with, a, with a particular instrument and with a particular kit, um, ignoring those guidelines could lead to unreliable interpretation, correct? Yes, sir. And doing an interpretation of that sort, as indicated, could potentially cost the lab their accreditation. They could no longer um, testify about their results in court if they lose their accreditation, correct? Well, that's a court issue, but they could lose their accreditation. Yes, it would not be good for the laboratory. Okay. And ultimately, uh, you agreed with Joel and Brown's interpretation of this sample that Mr. Segura could not be included, correct? Yes, sir. No further questions. Go ahead. Okay, first and foremost, we're talking about the grab bar, correct? Yes. So, you, okay. You're saying he cannot be included? From from that particular sample? Yeah. Uh, I think the data is pretty, un, uh, um, well, it's, it's limited data on there. There are some alleles that are present, but there's a limited data on, on that particular sample. Mr. Prince actually made two different statements. That you would agree that Mr. Uh, Ms. Brown um, testimony that he cannot be included. That was not her testimony. Her testimony was she could not exclude him from this sample. From the grab bar? Yeah. Oh, I thought you were talking about the other sample. My mistake. Um, I, would, I would have to look at the, well, I agreed with Miss uh, with Joanne Brown with her interpretation of, her, of what I reviewed in the report. That Mr. Segura cannot be excluded from this sample. If, I mean, I haven't reviewed my results on that, but I agreed with everything in her report, yes. Okay. Go for it, go for it. Just very briefly, just to be clear, and I know uh, we lawyers can get a little bit loose with the language sometimes. Um, not included and not excluded, those are two sides of the same coin, correct? Uh, yes. Insofar as it puts you in a position where you can't make a determination about somebody's potential contribution due to a lack of callable allele, that is allele for inclusion purposes over 100 RFUs, correct? Correct. And any attempt to include somebody in a mixture is gonna be further complicated if related persons are donors to that mixture, correct? Yes, sir. And similarly, when you have prevalent dropout throughout a sample combined with uh, multiple related persons donating to the mixture, that's gonna make it even messier, correct? Yes, sir. No further questions. Any direct questions?
Thank you, Runner. Sir, can you please state and spell both your first and last name for the court reporter? My name is Greg, G-R-E-G, Maimone, M-A-I-M-O-N-E. And what do you do for a living? I work for the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, assigned to the Impression Evidence Section. What does that mean? It uh, means I receive items of evidence from agencies. I examine those items of evidence for the presence of footwear or tire tracks. I then compare those to any known footwear or tire that's also submitted. And uh, did you have to go through any particularized education, training, um, or certification to be able to offer opinions about that type of evidence in court? Yes, I have a bachelor's degree in physics from the University of Virginia. I have a master's degree in forensic science from George Mason University, and I completed an approximately one-year training program with FDLE. And do you have to main maintain certain certifications with FDLE or some other governing body in order to be able to continue testifying about uh, your opinions as it relates to this type of evidence? No, we do not. Okay. Um, have you been previously qualified to testify as an expert in this area in court before? Yes, I have. Okay. Uh, approximately how many times? Approximately 19 times. And how many other cases beyond those you've actually testified in have you worked on? Hundreds. All right. Um, now, when, when you t say that you've worked on cases and you've testified in court, who is it that you testify for? I've testified for both the state attorneys and defense attorneys. Um, generally speaking, as a member of the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, it would be a state attorney's office or a law enforcement agency submitting evidence to you for review. Is that correct? The majority of items, yes. Okay. And that's what happened in this case as well, right? That's correct. Uh, when were you first involved in this, in this case? Uh, was involved in September of 2017. Okay. And what materials did you receive from either the submitting agency or the state attorney? I received a DVD and a two sets of footwear standards. Um, can you tell the jury what footwear standards are? Uh, they are representations from a person's shoes uh, recorded in, in this case it appeared to be ink on paper, um, but there are many ways to do it, but it's just a representation of the shoes someone was wearing or has. And so um, the reason a shoe impression standard would be taken uh, is to be able to determine whether those shoes um, resulted in impressions being left at a crime scene. Is that right? It's generally why, yes. And uh, do you have those shoe impression standards with you? I have photographs I took of them, yes. Okay. Can you pull those out? Exhibit 31A and B. Um, what are those things that you're looking at right there? Uh, these are uh, photographs that I printed after um, scanning the footwear standards. So these are exact re replicas of the actual standards themselves? A as close as can be, yes. Okay. And are they a true and accurate depiction of the shoe impression standards? Yes, they are. This time, Your Honor, I would request to move into evidence's defense composite exhibit 31A and B. This is so first we'll look at, uh, <coughs> I don't know that we're going to be able to fit both on there, but do the best we can here. So I guess let's start with, what are you looking at when you first get a set of standards like this um, before you try to, try to compare it to anything found at a crime scene? Uh, what, what types of characteristics are you looking at? Uh, the class characteristics are the first things I look at when I'm doing comparisons. What does that mean? What's a class? Uh, class characteristics are those items put there during the manufacturing process. So when a company manufactures a shoe or a boot or a tire, um, they put things there on purpose. They make a design uh, and they put that onto the shoe, onto the bottom of the shoe. Uh, those are those class characteristics. So it's the design of the shoe, the physical size, how big that those elements are in the shoe. Uh, whether it's a left shoe or a right shoe, things of that nature. Okay. And uh, the shoe impression standards you received in this case, they were from the first responding officers to the crime scene. Is that right? I don't know. It, it does have the officer's information down at the bottom here. We have Officer Jernigan, and the other set was from Officer Kidd, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, 
using these shoe impression standards, were you able to conduct any comparison to pictures of impressions left at the, at the scene of the crime in this case? Yes, I was. Okay. Um, what photographs did you use in order to conduct that comparison? is going to be referring to it from the CD that was submitted to me. Uh, photographs 993, 994, 997, 1156, uh, 1161, 1164, and 1165, 5763, 5771, 5822, and 5832. And it doesn't look like you have those, uh, those photos right there in front of you, is that correct? I do, yes. You do have them? Yes. Oh. Okay, so um, for identification purposes, this will be Defense Composite Exhibit 32A through K. Um, can you, before we uh, put those in evidence, can you tell me if those are fair and accurate depictions of the impressions that you used for <coughs> comparison to the, to the standards that we just looked at? They are. All right, I would request permission at this point to uh, put those into evidence as Defense Composite 32A through K. Any objections? They are. Request permission to publish. Uh, it's an area of carpet that was photographed. And were you able to draw any conclusions about the type of impression this was? Uh, I determined that there was not enough information to determine whether or not there was uh, an impression there. Okay. And that's common. Not every impression can be definitively characterized. Is that that's correct? correct. Okay. For subpart B, what do we have there? It's uh, another area of carpet that was photographed. Um, were you able to form any opinions about this one? Uh, again, there was a determination that there was no clear, distinct footwear impression or features there. There were apparent impressions of unknown origin. Um, what that means is there's some kind of uh, pattern that's visible on the tile there. Uh, I was unable to determine whether it had a distinct source of a footwear or a tire or something else, um, but I was able to get enough information to compare it to the footwear impression or the footwear standards that were submitted. And although it's difficult to see on the overhead, we can see the curved impression right there. There's just not enough detail to be able to make out a tread or anything like Correct. that. Correct. Okay. Um, since this is the first identifiable impression, uh, were you able to? Even though you couldn't identify this as uh, a shoe impress impression for sure, were you able to compare this to the shoe impression standards? I was. And were you able to make a determination about the possible contribution of those shoes to this impression? The footwear standards or shoes represented by the footwear standards were not made, did, could not have made the impressions of an unknown origin in this photograph. Okay. That was for subpart C. Um, subpart D here. What do we see? Uh, so uh, this is another area that so, was, <laughs> yeah, um, this is another area that was photographed. Uh, it appears to have been powdered prior to this photograph. Um, there are areas uh, on the photograph that have some kind of distinct manufactured pattern appearance. So they have linear lines. They don't look natural in origin. Um, and I determined these were, again, apparent impressions of unknown origin. Okay. And were you able to conduct a comparison to the shoe impression standards you have? I was. The shoes that repre are represented in the standards were not, could not have made those impressions. Okay. Subpart E, were you able to make any, uh, draw any conclusions about this potential impression? Uh, this is another apparent impression of unknown origin. You see the three lines kind of in the middle. Um, my designation is that red. Pointers there. Oh. Right. And, uh, 
There we go. There we go. I'm going to try not to hit you in the eye. <laughs> uh, so this red star right here is my marking. Uh, so this red star is my marking, and I'm marking these areas right here of these, for lack of a better term, lines that are on the tile there. Uh, again, it's an apparent impression of unknown origin. I don't know if it's a shoe, tire, something else. Uh, I was able to compare this to the footwear standards, and the shoes representing the footwear standards could not have made those impressions, or that impression. How about for subpart depth here? Are you able to make any determination about this potential impression? There's an area right here uh, that, again, is an apparent impression of unknown origin. Uh, so there's some kind of residual residue or something that came in contact with the tile there. Uh, it's an apparent impression of unknown origin. I compared it to the footwear standards, and the shoes represented in the footwear standards could not have made that. Another area here and here, and these kind of vertical lines going through, and then this has some squares or triangular blocks in that area there. Again, apparent impressions of unknown origin uh, was able to compare it to the footwear standards. The footwear standards could not have made those. So part H. So this, the area I was looking at was this area here, but I was unable to determine whether that was an impression or there's some broken glass or broken something in this area as well. And I was unable to determine whether this was a footwear impression feature or just from the residual glass. Uh, so I determined there was not enough information to determine if there was a, an impression there. Again, this is, uh, this is a, <laughs> another, I believe this is an area of carpet that's photographed again, and there was not enough information to determine whether or not there was an impression here. So part J. So here we have this area in question and this area in question. This is apparent footwear. It has um, the appearance of either a side or a toe or a heel of a, a footwear impression, but I can't determine it is definitively a footwear impression. And there are two areas in question, the left side of this tile and the right side of that tile. Uh, I was able to determine uh, that the shoes representative in the, in the footwear standards could not have made those. Okay, and lastly, for subpart K. It's the same area. Uh, exactly. It's uh, just a second photograph that I printed out. So those two areas are the same. It's just one's before processing and one's after processing. Okay. So the shoe impression standards were likewise excluded from that one? Correct. Now, um, in, in looking at those, you indicate that they're impressions of unknown, uh, unknown origin. Do you agree that uh, even though you weren't comfortable definitively classifying that? They could be shoes. They could be any number of things. Okay. Um, but even when you can't make a, a call about uh, a class of footwear um, or definitively characterize an impression, you can do exclusion comparison like you were just testifying about. That's that, correct. Right? Okay. And um, to be clear, you're employed by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement? That's correct. And have not been hired by the defense? You're I a have state not. witness, correct? No. Thank you. No further questions. Um, you kept saying impressions of unknown origin. Yes. Um, marks on a carpet is what they are. Don't know where they're from. Some of them, yes. Okay. I know there's one you said was, in fact, a footprint. And it's an apparent footprint. Okay. Um, all the other ones, other than that one spot, are marks on a carpet, marks on a tile of unknown origin. You don't know what caused them. That's correct. You can't say they're footwear. Can't say they're not footwear. Correct. Just something. Correct. Okay. Um, then you had one spot that actually has two photographs there that is a shoe impression. It's an apparent footwear impression. Okay. Um, there's two photographs, but we're only talking about one spot, correct? Correct. Okay. 
Nothing in your analysis indicates that there are five different impression types of impressions or footprints of shoes going in all different directions, is there? Yeah. So what we have is one footprint made in the house that is not the two law enforcement officers. One footwear impression and other impressions. And, and but correct, okay. So the one that we clearly say has the indications of a footwear impression with the two photographs. Correct. So we have one footwear spot there. We know it's not the law enforcement officers. Correct. Okay, no further questions. Redirect. <laughs> law enforcement agency or state attorney's office is interested in determining the potential contribution um, of a, a suspect or a defendant uh, to a probable footwear impression, you'll not only get standards from law enforcement, but they'll send you standards from that defendant's shoes as well, correct? That, that's correct. And that's why ordinarily, if they execute a search warrant at the defendant's home, they'll collect those shoes and either send you the shoes or impressions of them, is that correct? How, how they obtain the shoes, I don't know, but yes. Okay, and that didn't happen in this case, correct? That's correct. No further questions. All right. Hey, do you have a question of this witness? You accept that? Do we need to keep him any further? No, sir. Did you accept that? Clear up. Excuse me. We have another brief witness. Um, he's not that brief, and he can say over if the court wants him to. I mean, I, I think we Well, let's go to that part. You can move to the audience. Okay. Okay. Right. Lawyers said they're tired. They want to go home. So <laughs> anyway. <laughs> we'll see you in the morning, 845. Don't discuss the case with anyone. Don't let anyone discuss it with you. Have a good evening. All right. Two witnesses we have to do Monday morning. Yes, sir. yes, sir. yes. Sir. Um, so how long do you think that's going to take? I think most, yeah, the most uh, <coughs> not a couple hours. Yeah, I think we ended up probably about two hours on Knox, and yeah, it was probably about an hour. Probably been the I'll take so probably you. by lunchtime. Yes, sir. Monday. Yeah. I just don't want the jury to start thinking, well, oh, it's too but anyway, so the plan would be that uh, we'll have a pretty full day tomorrow and a half day on Monday. And I, I was assuming.
assuming y'all want to do the instructions and close all at one time. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So we'll plan to do that Tuesday morning. Yeah, and then obviously on Monday afternoon, I'm going to get on and go over the instructions. Uh, really sad, but it's all right. Yeah, we need to do that Monday afternoon. It's, you need to be discussing. Um, both of you need to decide whether you're going to require the jury to be sequestered if, if they don't uh, come to a result Tuesday, because uh, bailiffs need to do some work if, if you're not going to waive that. Have you all discussed that? Uh, yes, sir. We would the parties would request that uh, they be sequestered. Okay. All right. So bailiffs need to be working on rooms for Tuesday night. All right, anything else? No, no, no. You had raised something about Whitfield, but then 